So banks are facing just an entire you know, collection of problems, but they're currently based on the fact, uh, mostly, that the liquidity that they had in treasuries is not worth what it used to be. And the money that people are taking out is leaving too quickly. And they just can't make the math work. And that's where we're going to see um, a lot more bank failures. And that was one of the main reasons that Fitch and Moody's basically said they were looking at either downgrading or looking for a downgrade of a lot of the banks in the United States, because the problem isn't going away. Just because the Fed stops raising rates doesn't mean that this problem, which is currently baked into the cake of the banking system at the moment, is going to go away. It's, it's going to be there for a while. We've been living in an era of cheap money. Will this all change soon? And what were the consequences of this era? Let's discuss what's next for the Federal Reserve, our economy, and markets with our next guest, Dr. Nomi Prince, geopolitical analyst, economist, and the best-selling author of Permanent Distortion, How Financial Markets Abandoned the Real Economy Forever. Nomi, welcome to the show, The David Lynn Report. Good to see you. Thank you so much, and congratulations! You are killing it with this new show, and um, thank you. And you've, and you've had such amazing, amazing guests. I'm really honored to be um, to be a part of your roster, David. I, I I thank you for being a part of this roster. You are an amazing guest yourself, which is why we're having you today. So very honored to be speaking with you. Let's start by talking about the Fed and uh, what you think they're going to do next. The meeting minutes came out today on Wednesday um, of their last uh, meeting in in July. And it seems to be a little bit more evenly split in terms of whether or not they're going to hike again. Uh, economists broadly expect this month to be, or last month rather, to be the last hike. What is your expectation? Yeah, I don't, I don't see the need for them um, as it seems from their minutes and the whole sort of mixed messaging behind not just the minutes, but also the Q&A that accompanied um, the 25 basis point move that we saw um, last time. I think that was a vanity move to a large extent because at that point, um, at the last meeting, uh, we had already seen inflation, which is the sort of barometer of what the Fed is supposedly looking for, come down. Um, Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell had talked about being data dependent, but then he also left the door open for another rate hike. I think that was basically to appease um, a sort of confidence boosting sort of vanity ego type of, of rate hiking at that point, because it, the, the, the last hike wasn't really data dependent. Um, so I don't think that we're going to have another one because the data really hasn't um, shown us that that we really need to, or specifically, and I've said this for, for, for a long time now, that the Fed has the ability to control inflation whatsoever at all anyway at this point. I mean, yes, they have um, an ability to control the level at which lending happens the level at which mortgages occur, the level that people pay on their credit cards because of the level that rates are at, but they don't have the ability to control the supply chain. They don't have the ability to control any additional geopolitical tension we might see with respect to the price of oil, which could um, you know, sort of turn into more inflation from the standpoint of energy prices and so forth that we may see to come. So they're in this position where they wanted to take in a victory lap um, based on what they have done with the, the 525 basis points of now total hikes that they've done since last March. Um, and I don't think, um, and this is what's really come out of the minutes, that they're planning on, on doing another hike. Now, they've left the door open, of course, because uh, they don't know what's going to happen. But the reality is um, they can't control inflation at this point anyway. And so I don't think that we're going to see um, any other hike. If we do like the last one, I think it'll be a vanity hike. Um, this isn't a policy measure. This is literally just to put your sort of foot in the sand and say, look, we've done it. We're in control. Um, but but that's that's not really policy. That's personality. Uh, just to clarify, when you say that they can't control inflation, are you suggesting, Nomi, that perhaps the uh, reduction in the CPI, uh, that is to say the lower inflation that we've seen over the last six months, was not a result of the higher Fed funds rate, but perhaps a result of something else? It was a result of um, a number of things. Now, from the standpoint of supply chain, from the standpoint of energy prices, from the standpoint of what we saw there, uh, the reality is the fuel prices did come down. Now, the, the Fed didn't exactly have control over uh, a, a global environment of fuel coming down. Yes, tightening rates 
does indicate that there could be a constraint on the economy. If the economy is constrained, it could use less fuel. Fuel, If it uses less fuel, then fuel prices could come down because demand is coming down. But the reality is a lot of the reason that, that fuel prices came down was because they had spiked so much uh, to begin with into, um, in particular, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. That's when we saw a lot of activity around the price of oil, around the price of natural gas, around the price of wheat commodities and everything else. And so we did see... Um, a sort of additional supply chain effect that um, came into our overall inflation numbers. Because all inflation numbers, to some extent, um, if they're not financial specifically, but they are real materialistically um, sort of gauged, rely on energy. Now, can the Fed control the price of housing? Does raising rates mean that there are less borrowers? Do less borrowers mean less mortgages being taken out? Do less mortgages mean less of an ability to, to buy houses? Does that bring the prices of houses down? Yes. So from the standpoint of that component of inflation, yes, the Fed did have an impact. From the standpoint of the physical other forms of inflation, I think that was an issue of a lot of supply chains loosening up for now, um, and that it was coincident with the raising of rates. If you believe that this may be the last rate hike, could you also believe then that the economy is only going to grow faster from here and that perhaps we could avoid any sort of landing altogether? I, I don't think it means that the, the economy is only going to grow from here. There'll be pockets of the economy that will grow. For example, this entire time that the Fed has been raising rates, we have seen a factory boom in the middle of the United States, in the West and the far West, that has far superseded any factory boom we have seen since World War II. Now, we're not paying attention to that because we're looking at the overall economy. But for example, the figures that came out in April to show the factory production of new factories being built were four times that of prior Aprils. That's during COVID, that's pre-COVID. So we've seen a lot of funding go into an element of the economy, in particular, the part of the economy that is going to produce, the part of the economy that's been stimulated to an extent by a combination of private investment in those areas, as well as some very large bills that came out of Congress and bipartisan bills, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, the bipartisan um, Infrastructure Act, as well as the CHIPS Act and other forms of um, acts along the way that have basically allowed for this, this funnel of funds and subsidies to go into real, real creation of real uh, factory manufacturing construction that has really happened and is kind of off the charts in the middle of the country. So parts of the economy are going to grow and have been growing anyway. Other parts of the economy could continue to slow down. We could see a continued slowdown in the housing market. We could see a continued slowdown in, in business lending and small business lending, not these sort of large production measures measures, which are somewhat um, connected to government funding as well as private investing, but to individuals. We are seeing banks collapsing right now. We are seeing um, you know, Fitch and Moody's basically downgrade or looking to watch on downgrade more banks uh, for more potential failures. That's going to constrain lending. Constraining lending is going to constrain parts of the economy that require lending. So it's going to be a very mixed environment. It's not a be-all, end-all for the economy growing or the economy shrinking. Parts are going to grow. Parts are going to be constrained. And I think net-net, the Fed's number of 1% to 1.5% GDP growth um, is not far off from what we're actually going to see. So it's a little bit of growth. You take what's actually inflation out of that growth, and we're pretty much stagnant overall. But again, some parts are increasing and some parts are, are declining. Uh, just to bring up real estate, because you brought up the housing market, this is a surprising stat for some people. In May, uh, home building projects surged in the United States by the most in more than three decades, and permits for future construction also climbed, uh, suggesting the housing market may be turning a corner. Uh, this is from a Reuters article in June. Were you, were you surprised that starts, at least housing starts this year, uh, climbed uh, despite higher interest rates? And actually, if you look at the Case-Shiller Home Index, that's been ticking up back as well. What's going um, on there? Well, no, I mean, it goes back to what I was saying before about how much the Fed really has control over. So it can have marginal control over housing prices and obviously over the the, the mortgage market and, and, and the financing market. Um, and we did see some of that. But we've also seen, again, this resurgence um, and this incredible build of, of factories and construction for manufacturing. And, and a knock-on effect to that um, are these new starts, are the new home constructions, which are kind of a part of that. And often um, some of the same manufacturers are involved in both the commercial side, the factory side, as well as some 
in the larger um, residential projects. So it's not surprising that the funding for this, for, for the initial builds, um, is, is actually coming from um, longer term planning and, and, and is the result of looking ahead and not necessarily where the average um, borrower can afford a mortgage right now. Now, it could be that in the future, some of these home projects don't necessarily meet with um, borrowers because there is constrained lending for the average mortgage um, borrower. But we, we, we don't know that. And that's why we're seeing the, this dichotomy of um, numbers that are coming for new construction on the on the residential and on the commercial and factory side versus um, financing for that residential individual borrower, which which is tighter, or the small business, which is tighter. We're seeing this kind of um, shift and sort of um, divide between people that need and, and small businesses that need funding to grow or borrow for themselves. And then those that get their sources of funds from larger pools of money um, and are taking that strategy ahead. So it's an interesting um, kind of split that we're seeing right now in that economy. The Fed doesn't have much to do with the government side of that. The Fed doesn't have much to do with factory building or large scale construction on the residential side. It does have something to do with borrowers, as we were talking about before. It can, again, constrain lending for small businesses because rates are higher. So there is, again, this, this dichotomy, and we're seeing that in the split in the banking system. You know, this is why um, we're also seeing some real problems come about on uh, a lot of the balance sheets of banks right now, in addition to the, the failures that we saw earlier this year um, and the downgrades that we're seeing right now. And the 722 banks that the Fed itself has circled um, since the beginning of this year for, for possible failure or possible real problems, that all has to do with um, where rates are um, and the level of um basically margin that's declining for those banks because of where rates are. So again, lots of different pockets um, that are both positive and also negative because of uh, the Fed's policy. So let's talk about uh, some of the problems in our economy and tie it back to your book, uh, Permanent Distortion. Now, let's talk about the banking sector in particular before we perhaps branch out. You mentioned the 700 or so banks that the Fed circled as potential problems. Why do they have problems now is my bigger question. And how did we get here? Um, it, it's a really good question, and, and and each of the banks that failed had had different magnitudes of of the same problem. But but the main problem um, is that banks effectively have collateral on the side or reserve money all, all on the side, which is generally liquid treasury bonds, right? And when the value of those treasury bonds declines because rates go up, um, that that that's just the math of it. The the amount of of liquidity that a bank can draw upon by selling those treasuries that now have less value than they bought them at um, is mitigated. So what that means is if a bank is trying to basically retain people's deposits um, and isn't paying enough interest, which a lot of these banks were not, and a lot of the banks on this list are not. I mean, you look at even with rates having gone up by 525 basis points, you look at the savings rate of even the bigger banks, even like a JP Morgan or Bank of America, and it's, it's, it's tiny. Um, and then you look at the sort of middle level banks, some of the ones that failed, First Republic, it's tiny. Um, and so people want to find a different place to put their money. So you've got deposits being extracted. You have banks trying to make up for that liquidity with selling treasury bonds that have less value than they had when they bought them because rates have gone up and the value therefore has gone down. And you have this, this basically liquidity problem that's facing the entire banking sector. And then you add on to that the fact that it's harder for people to borrow because they can't afford to pay the higher rates. So therefore, banks can't make as much of as much money as they might like to by virtue of being able to charge higher rates because people can't afford to take uh, loans out or the um, the requirements for taking those loans, whether it's a mortgage or a small business, are so much greater um, that the banks are basically unable to really even work the, the margin math on, on higher rates um, and borrowing on, on, on that side of the balance sheet. So they're facing a whole lot of problems. I mean, that doesn't even that doesn't even count. Um, how these higher rates on existing loans um, could come back to bite the banks, which is that if people can't afford to pay uh, for as long a time higher rates on mortgages, because the assumption was that rates would go down and they wouldn't have to pay these high rates for so long and they have mortgages and they can't afford to pay for them. Or same thing with small businesses. And now the money the banks are expecting um, on these forms of loans might not be coming in as much as they had expected it would when they extended those loans. So that could be another problem. Defaults, foreclosures could could result as uh, could be a result of that. So so banks are facing just an entire you know collection of problems, but they're currently based on the fact uh, mostly that the liquidity that they had in treasuries is not worth what it used to be 
And the money that people are taking out is leaving too quickly and they just can't make the math work. And that's where we're going to see um, a lot more bank failures. And that was one of the main reasons that Fitch and Moody's basically said they were looking at either downgrading or looking for a downgrade of a lot of the banks in the United States, because the problem isn't going away. Just because the Fed stops raising rates doesn't mean that this problem, which is currently baked into the cake of the banking system at the moment, is going to go away. It's it's going to be there for a while. Another sector that perhaps is at risk is commercial real estate, and a lot of the regional banks are very much exposed to this sector. Is there actually a risk, Nomi, of commercial real estate failing across the nation right now? Um, well, it, it, the same thing as, as with residential real estate. The, the commercial real estate that could fail, particularly related to offices, to, to the very high vacancy rates that we're seeing across the country, to builds that started that weren't completed because there wasn't enough money left to complete them. Um, these are all things that are at risk in terms of commercial mortgages and, and the larger um, commercial lending that happened because of that. And, and what happens with the regional banks um, that, that sought that business in particular and that are most exposed to that type of business in particular is it, it only takes one or two big projects to, to really corrode their entire portfolio of commercial loans. So you can see a situation where only one or two or just a handful of large projects fail um, because there isn't enough money to basically pay to either complete them or to pay for the, the higher levels of, of commercial loans. And a loan portfolio could, could therefore fail again because the bank doesn't have enough money set aside to cover the potential failures. So, so yes, we could see um, more commercial loans failing, um, and particularly in the real estate sector, the commercial real estate sector. And again, for those regional banks, because they don't have a lot of, of hedging that goes on around that. They basically have, again, treasuries, money on the side that's supposed to be secure throughout the process of lending, whether it's to residences or small businesses or commercial lending. And now they have a situation where they don't have what they thought they had. So when things start to fail, they have less money, less liquidity available to plug those holes. Could the reverse happen where a regional bank fails because of uh, mismatch and duration or other issues and then pull down commercial real estates on their books as a result? Is that likely? Um, it's not likely unless the entire bank fails and they haven't basically sold off that commercial mortgage um, to somewhere else. And in a lot of these instances, the, the banks that that did the initial um lending don't necessarily keep the loan. Um, there, there is a chain of, of loans, so it, it might not be that one causes the other, but it's certainly the case that if they're not receiving um, the payments or, in fact, the project's default, um, then those individual banks are at risk, even if they've sold them on for a part of that money that was sort of promised along the way. One of the themes that you've discussed in your book, and you know, I encourage people to check out the books for themselves, you've gone into great detail of how the financial markets work and interact with each other. But one of the themes you discussed is the era of cheap money in the past that has maybe created some of the bubbles that we're seeing right now. If we were to take the view, Nomi, that rates have gone up a lot since you wrote the book, could you make the argument that some of these problems are now fixing themselves because of the higher rates? Or is that too simple an argument? Well, I think what we've been talking about is 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 that they aren't fixing themselves and that higher okay. rate bringing in another set of problems. <laughs> um, but what's happened is this: um, when when we've had so much money um, available so cheaply for um, you know so many years, you know, since the financial crisis, really before, since the beginning of the two thousands. I mean, the financial crisis just put rates at zero. It was one and a half percent or so in the beginning of the two thousands. So we've been talking about very low rates for a very long time. Um, what increased at the wake of the financial crisis and doubled in the wake of COVID was amount of money that was also created or sort of electronically printed um, in return for bonds or assets um, in the market, which still reside mostly on the Fed's books. So the problem actually has not been solved from the standpoint of the fact that the Fed still has about $8.1, $8.2 trillion worth um, of bonds on its book for which it has basically fabricated that amount of money. Now, at the height of the amount of money fabrication that the Fed had done, um, it had about $9 trillion of, of money created about four and a half in the wake of the financial crisis. It went down a little bit before COVID. It went up a little bit into COVID. COVID happened. It doubled. There's like, I go, th I, I go through all the math, but the point being that there's a lot of money still on the Fed's books and only about 9% of it um, has basically been reduced by virtue of the treasury bonds and other bonds it was holding maturing. So it's QE process and that it buys bonds in return for printing money that has ceased. 
But this idea that it's really tightening, it's not really selling bonds off its balance sheet. That money is still on offer to the financial system. Um, it's just 9% less than it was, it was at its tippy top height um, after COVID, which was about double what it was after the financial crisis. So, so the fact is this entire cheap money mechanism hasn't really uh, gone away anyway. What's happened is rates have gone up um, and they are higher than they have been. And that's that's creating the problems that we've talked about because they've gone up so quickly that people um, and businesses haven't had that that time to potentially adjust. Um, it's not like they're very high historically if you go back before the 20 years, but they're certainly uh, higher now than they've been. Um, but it doesn't mean that the cheap money has, has gone away. That would mean the Fed effectively and other central banks selling the trillions of dollars of bonds that they have on their books in return for the cash back. That won't happen. That would crash the markets. So we really have to look at the totality of all Fed policy um, to see that in general, uh, despite what's happened with rates, which is a tightening form of policy, the totality of it still has on offer um, a lot of money to the financial systems. And without that money, um, they would they would absolutely collapse. And even when we have situations along the way, like with Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic earlier this year, the Fed created over $330 billion worth of cash to buy bonds been, you know, effectively in a nanosecond. All right. So they still maintain, which I talk about in my book, the ability to create money, um, to fabricate, to electronically, you know, digitize the accounting, however you call it, to create money in order to buy securities from uh, the banking system, from the market when they feel they need to. That has not gone away. And that has the fact that they could do it in such mass during the last period of bank failures. And again, I don't think we're over bank failures uh, means they can do it again. So we are still in a period of, of a distorted, as I call it, relationship between financial markets, financial system and the real economy. But as so somebody might push back and say, Nomi, as, as a, an American business owner or even a consumer, wouldn't you want cheap money? Wouldn't you want low rates? Isn't that good for consumption, for growth, for even lending and borrowing? It's what we need to grow our economy is cheap money. Our society is based on cheap money. Why make it stop? Right. So as I basically put in a graph in, the, in like the very first couple of pages in Permanent Distortion, it's not so much... Uh, that the money itself is cheap. It's where that cheap money goes. And if it's going primarily into financial assets at the expense of the real economy, real industry, real preservation, real national security, real you know, retooling of education, retooling of workers, just, just everything that basically creates growth in the real economy. And I don't mean the kind of growth that happens after you shut down the economy for COVID and you reopen it again. Not that kind of spiky growth because something unnatural occurred. I mean that... Uh, and I, I have this, this graph in the beginning of the book, when, when the average growth of the U.S. economy, for example, um, in terms of GDP, and that's not a perfect measure, that's a whole other conversation we could have, is effectively between zero and two percent over many, many years. And the market has the ability to increase by substantially more than that, given the flow of money, then it's it's the placement of that money that's the problem. Um, so, so to your point, sure, if, if an individual or a business person or a, an R&D uh, component of a large uh, corporation can be able to access more money more cheaply to grow and to have substantive long-term value um, that basically continues to have long-term growth impact on the economy. That's great. That's not what happened. And so a lot of the numbers that I talk about in the graphs that I show in the book um, basically show um, that it's it's where the money goes. Um, that's That's the real issue. And what we're seeing as a result, even right now, is with rates having gone up, um, effectively, we are paying as a country about a half a trillion dollars worth of interest on, on our bonds. So that's a significant portion. That's about one to one and a half percent of GDP. If GDP is growing one to one and a half percent, which we talked about in the beginning um, in terms of what the Fed has forecast or what it might be, we're effectively paying off our debt to stay even. That's not growing the economy. Now, in the background, the stock market might grow and certain companies might see their stocks you know, rise and, and they may buy them back and that can increase them as well, but that's not necessarily a natural progression. So there's nothing wrong with lower rates. The issue is if we're looking at true lasting economic growth or permanent growth um, and the money is only going into financial assets or, or sort of paper assets, then we're not making the investments um, that we could be making with that money. So the issue again is placement. Would you agree or disagree with the assessment that even though financial assets have 
outpace the growth of the real economy. The real economy of the U.S. is still doing better than its peers, namely the BRICS countries. So if you were to evaluate BRICS versus the real economy of the U.S., the U.S. is still better. Agree or disagree? <laughs> Well, I mean, it, it depends on, on which of those those countries we look at. I mean, even if we look at China, which is we've been talking about how their 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 growth isn't as quick as as it was or as its forecast. I mean, it's still five percent compared to the one percent in the U.S. So, I mean, it, it really depends on on which of those countries we, we look at. And also, if we're looking at the future, where um, where that money is going. So if it's going into um, natural resources or infrastructure um, or uh, basically, you know, sort of more um, efficient and economic energy to to power um, its technologies or its populations. And we have to look at growth in the economy as a sort of longer term process. So whether we look at it this year, um, just like the U.S. to China, or whether we look at it on a forward basis, like are we putting our dollars um, in the places that's going to continue to give us um, or any country, but us in particular, because we're talking about the United States, a, com- a competitive edge. Um, well, we, we haven't necessarily been doing that. And, and I would say, though, that the factory building that we are seeing in the middle of the country, um, whether that is for manufacturing of, of semiconductors, of chips, of, of renewable energy technologies, of nuclear energy technologies, or whatever it might be that's being built in the center of the country, that is something that actually could um, have a lasting impact on our um on our economic growth and also our independence um, from an energy and economic perspective going forward. So let's, since we're on the topic of BRICS, we have to discuss uh, the summit that's supposed to take place next week in South Africa. Uh, on the agenda, uh, the main point is probably the discussion of including other members into the BRICS uh, economy right. or, or circle, if you want to call it that. Uh, in terms of its impact on the markets, Naomi, what, what, what changes do you think will happen next week after the summit that you think investors should probably take note of? Yeah, that's that's a that's a really good question. And there's a couple things. Um, one of the main objectives of of the BRICS and the sort of greater BRICS, you know, the 40 countries or so that want to be a part of it is to have um, some sort of a trading um, an economic leverage to the sort of Western United States dollar-based um, environment. It's not to say that they're going to all stop trading with the United States and its allies or anything like that, but it's the idea that as a bloc, we have we have that kind of economic um, power. And I've been involved with um, a lot of the development um, analysis and research of the BRICS for, uh, well, since the beginning. And a lot of the um, BRICS uh, policies and, and their sort of manifesto that's come about occurred in the wake of the financial crisis of 2008, 2009. That's that's when um, you know, the main countries said, look, we are not comfortable with um, the instability of the dollar. We're not comfortable with the Fed. We're not comfortable with the banking system kind of chaos. Um, and we want our own thing. Now that's grown into, um, we want to have our own energy sources. We want to have our own trading blocks. We want to have our own um, ability to trade with each other, um, whether it's a petro, call it petro brick or whatever it becomes, but effectively to sort of monetize commodities with each other. And we also have the resources. So so why shouldn't we do that? Um, and so we're at a time now where what's going to come out of this conference isn't going to be the answer to all that. This is the 15th summit that these countries have had. It just happens to have a lot more attention um, and happens to have a lot more countries who want to be involved. And and as that as a result, that's what we're going to be talking about. What does that mean? Uh, well, for one thing, it's not on the agenda, but there's always there's always talk, there's obviously talk about some sort of a gold linked currency or some sort of a unified currency um, through which the BRICS and any expanded BRICS countries can trade in with each other or can settle balances in country to country. Now, so the average person in the street has like a brick gold thing, but the basically, ultimately, there's there's some sort of a, a trade balance currency. Um, so that's going to get discussed, I think, in the ether, even though it's not currently on the agenda um, for, for the meeting. And what that's going to do is make people... Um, take a closer look at gold, I think, throughout the world. Obviously, central banks, those particular central banks, the BRICS banks, as well as some of the greater BRICS banks, um, have been buying more gold recently. China, of course, has been leading that in terms of the expansion of gold buying. Um, But it's not to necessarily have a gold-backed currency. It's to have a gold potentially linked currency. It's not going to replace the dollar, but it's going to be something that they can work on amongst themselves and use amongst themselves in the future. Um, that's going to create more attention to gold. That's going to create more attention to the fact that gold is a scarce resource. And that's going to, I think, ultimately um, put a bigger bid for gold. Now, central banks are only about 15 to 20 percent of the owners of gold in the world, of mine gold. Um, so there's certainly other um, actors that can 
uh, that can really come on board um, that as well. But it, and, and also it's not just gold, it's, it's energy. Um, it's a pooling of rare earth minerals. It's a pooling of um, energy resources. It's pooling of uranium. It's a pooling of fuel, of natural gas, of oil. And basically the idea that we can fund each other's projects energy projects, as well as uh, trade with each other, potentially in either agreement through our block or ultimately in some sort of currency units units that, that we may want to be talking about. So the investors should look at that as well, is, is what kind of fuels, what kind of uh, resources are basically going to be pooled together um, by the BRICS countries. And where does that leave the demand um, and how that demand is going to be met in the rest of the countries? And that's going to cause some I think some price squeezes um, of a number of those resources like uranium, like lithium, like, like resources that are part of the sort of energy, um, both transition and also um, some of it's going backwards. Natural gas, I think is, is also going to really see upside from this as well, because there's kind of a realignment as to what's, well, there has been um, happening on that basis as well. So we're going to see prices in some fuels rise. We're going to see prices in some fuel commodities rise and uh, critical minerals rise and, and also gold from a financial commodity rise, I think. Okay, so let, let's talk about that uh, a little bit more since you brought it up. So the energy transition, what is the energy priority of, oh, it's really hard to break it down to the world, isn't it? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, the, the, the areas that you're looking at, the countries that you've examined. Um, the, the main energy desire is to be able to fuel population growth and an infrastructure investment, which also- uh, I, Sorry, let me just, yeah, I'm back up from, I, I asked that question because I understand that different countries have different priorities and I've heard yeah, that yeah. an emerging market may actually still want to use fossil fuels. It is the most efficient way oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. to industrialize, whereas Western yes. countries are moving on to something else. But yeah, please continue. Yeah, you know, and, and that's and that's a really great point, David, because because it doesn't mean when I talk about energy transition, it's it's not necessarily that everybody's gonna go to some combination of like solar energy and lithium batteries, right? It's it, there 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 are steps to that. And there are countries that have natural resources like oil and natural gas or coal um, that want to be a part of, of energy growth. Um, right. So there's a couple of different transitions. There, there is transition to, to cleaner energy, and that could be renewable. That could be more efficient batteries. That could be more efficient electrification. That could be natural gas versus oil. But that doesn't mean that oil is going to go away. It doesn't mean that natural gas is going to be supplanted by wind. What it means is there's different um, countries that are going to want to use what they have um, and what they have access to to barter um, in order to have the most in energy independence that they can within the block that they share with each other. So if that means more development um, of wind turbines in India or more development of, um, of nuclear plants in, in China or more development of, of solar and critical elements projects in Brazil, all of these things um, are really part of, of their, their agenda. So energy transition for these countries means using what they have, being allowed to, uh, well, not being allowed to, but, but uh, Deploying it to grow, uh, deploying it to be stronger economically and from an infrastructure and energy independence standpoint, um, and to trade with each other. So it, it looks different for all of them. Um, some of it is to transition to a cleaner form of energy, but that again can take different forms. That can take cleaner technologies, that could take different technologies for emission reductions in, in sort of fossil fuels. It can also include growing renewables, but renewables, of course tie into existing electric grids. So it also requires updating and upgrading and expanding electric grids because all these countries need electricity to operate. It could be talking about wireless charging mechanisms, which requires sort of mag magnetic electricity as opposed to uh, simply a grid. So I mean, there's, there's different ways that this is ultimately over years going to unravel, but ultimately these countries want to use what they have with each other to maximize their energy equation, part of which is current, part of which which means fossil, part of which is carbon reduction, and part of which is transition to something more renewable and more based on the elements, meaning sun, wind, or physical critical elements out of the earth as well. If we just look at nuclear for a minute, it's it's interesting how if you look at the nuclear power plants being uh, being constructed right now, most of them are happening in the east, so India and China, uh, some Middle East as well. 
on the on the other on the other side, the West is shutting down nuclear power plants. Why why is there this big divergence in attitude towards nuclear between the West and the East? Well, I think the East was more um, forward looking about nuclear than than the West has been for a while. And what happened was. Uh, and currently, as you mentioned, China, India, Russia, and they've been looking at nuclear power for, for a longer period of time while the West has basically been shunning it because, well, I think a lot of a lot of it is because of just a lack of understanding as to the, the fact that nuclear just needs to be safer. We have things like small modular reactors that can be deployed much more um, in a much smaller environment than, than large sort of monstrosity kind of looking like nuclear plants. There, there's ways to, to reduce the footprint, the physical look of nuclear um, and also make it safer. Um, there's a lot that's coming on the United States on that. There, there, is, uh, there are two major acts that are going into the uh, National Defense Authorization Act right now that are uh, part of this, this bigger conglomerate of, of a budget that's going to be passed uh, shortly uh, when Congress gets back into session, finishes hammering it out sometime this fall, let's say, and I say shortly as Congress. So, um, But basically includes two major acts in nuclear, the Advance Act and the Nuclear Fuel Security Act, both of which um, take two different pieces of nuclear from the United States perspective, one of which is nuclear technologies and one of which is nuclear fuel security, um, which has to do with uranium, where you get it, where you don't get it from in terms of allies and, and, and domestically versus um, versus not um, to compete on the nuclear front. So we We've been late to it, right? Um, because we've taken a step back. But but there's definitely uh, many many steps moving forward on the nuclear side of the United States um, because of this desire to be um, fuel independent and to recognize that that doesn't just mean being the you know world's number one natural gas exporter. I mean, there's a lot of different ways um, to get there, and, and those ways can be better and more efficient. Um, there's been a lot of bipartisan support for, for all of that on the nuclear side in Congress, um, and I speak to a lot of those people um, on a regular basis, but um, I imagine that the NDA is going to get passed eventually this, this fall, just a lot of arguing, but not over the nuclear parts um, before that happens. And so we've just kind of been slow to get back into it, the West, um, particularly the United States, but I think if the United States kind of comes back as it is with this kind of momentum, that that we'll see just a kind of universal global push for uh, nuclear power, uranium, those resources, and ways to make it safer and and less of a sort of physical footprint um, in terms of its um, how it how it's processed and how it's deployed. Now, on the issue of like, electrification and going green, do we have the critical or the, the necessary supply of critical metals to meet these very ambitious lofty goals of, let's say, carbon neutral by 2050, entirely EV fleet by 2030 in some jurisdictions? No, <laughs> no, not, not, not a chance. They're, they're very, very lofty. And, and look, it's, it's, it's good to have those, those, you know, forward lines in the sand and, and, and have the goals. The reality is that um, it gets back to our electric grid. Even, even if we have the supply of, of, of rare earth minerals and critical elements, which we do not um, in the United States, we, we, we get them from other places. And yes, we're trying to get them more from allies like Australia and Canada and so forth. And that's happening. But again, we've, we've, we've taken a long time to sort of figure this out. But even if we had all of what we needed, we don't have a grid um, that's effectively strong enough um, for all of these forms of new energy to plug into. So this idea of, of having an EV, um, you know, sort of owned by every person in the country, you know, in order to do that, you have to figure out a way to power the EVs and you have to basically power them currently by electricity. And in order to do that, you have to have enough um, load um, ability on the grids that we have to allow those things to be powered. We saw this last summer that you know, California, the, the number one sort of EV uh, car state in our country had to effectively tell people to, to stop charging because it was overloading other parts of the electric grid, other parts of the system and cause, causing you know power outages, which it does when it's hot because there's other draws that are happening on the same grid like AC. Um, so so there, there's so much that needs to effectively be fixed and, and augmented on just the power grid side for us to even get to um, having the ability to, to hook in and charge all those vehicles. And then if you add to that the, the materials that are needed to do that, um, you know, 10 years from now is, is not or 12 is not. That's not that long from now. I mean, it's. This is not something that's going to take just 12 years or till, you know, 2030. This is something 2030, 2030. We did the different marks in the sand. I mean, we, we've got some work to do.
Right. So, so you're expecting what either either a surge in infrastructure development over the next ten to fifteen years, or uh, or a, a sort of surge in supply somehow that comes from either the United States or abroad. I, I think both of those two things are happening, and I think neither one of them uh, will get to the current goals that are set. Um, so, so, so all of that's going to be all three of those things are going to be in play. Okay. Nomi, where can we um, learn more from you? And well, actually, tell us what you're working on now, and maybe we can stay tuned for another book, perhaps, or, <laughs> or writing on a regular basis. Um, thanks. So, well, you, you can always check me out at my website, nomiprince.com, and I do have a, a mailing list on there to, to keep people kind of abreast of what I'm thinking about for, for a possible new book um, right now. Uh, and it's it's just it's free to sign up. It's just it's just right there. Just um, contact form, fill it out, and you'll hear from me maybe once a month. Not more, not more than that. I will, I will not uh, be bombarding uh, the inbox there. But um, I am looking very critically at um, this question that we've been talking about. I really appreciate all your all your um, questions about it on on the show, David, because you're just so insightful on on just the bigger picture here. But of the intersection of geopolitics, economics. And energy and and the materials um, and infrastructure building that's needed to make it all sort of happen because we're in a moment right now historically um, where there's a lot of changing going on um, and for me as a researcher as a journalist as an author that that's always when it gets really exciting you don't know what's going to happen um, but you know it's happening you don't know how it's going to ultimately play out I should say but but you know it's happening and we are in a major um, transition, evolution, revolution, whatever you want to call it, of economics, geopolitics, and energy. And um, that triangle is is really, really interesting. And so that might be a big part of a new book. Okay. All right. Well, we'll look forward to that for now. We'll follow your work in the links down below. I'll put, a dis- put it in the description. Nomi, thank you very much. We haven't talked about geopolitics much today. We'll save that for another conversation where we can dive <laughs> deeper into the major risks Uh, or perhaps opportunities that investors have given the geopolitical dynamics. So thank you very much for your time today. I look forward to speaking with you next time. Appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe.